get this thing out of the way. Hang on a second. Okay, there we go. The first minute's the toughest. Okay, welcome to week five. Uh, Donner Pass, who came, what they did, what they left, and where they went. And let's take care of some business first. First of all, the Friday Forum. Um, we've done drama in this class already. If you recall, the Donner Party had uh, a drama done about them. So we should, we are veterans of drama. And this is about the theater. So those of you that are theater, theater oriented, this is for you on Friday, uh, Director Buck Busfield. And he's um, a leader in the Sacramento arts community. So if you wanna to go to that, uh, please sign up. You can enroll until Monday, or excuse me, Friday noon, and then you can, then you can see it. Okay. The other thing is, I gotta get this done ahead of time. I'm already getting heat about the fact that my green is minimal. I will tell you that I don't have anything that's green, but what I did was just to get the people there, the particular people off their case, I'm gonna back up and show, this was on my front porch today. This is, for those of you guys, folks that don't know, that is the Irish flag. So I'm showing my colors here. And so I don't want anything about this black shirt, although the black shirt is in memory of the Boston Marathon, which I ran 10 years ago. So it's kind of Irish anyway. Okay, so let's get serious here. And we can start. After I wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day and stay out of trouble. Okay, down the pass, week five. This is about roads, 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 and roads. And um, this is a um, painting. It's like a painting or a colored in copy a colored in picture of Donner Pass. And notice the interesting part about this is about 1916, the lack of trees. Um, they had done so much building on the mines, on the railroad. You can see the snowshoes, the snowsheds right here, that they everything, all this is all second growth timber. And just for an interesting um, insight into why they use so much timber, or one of the reasons they use so much timber, I was at the museum in, a little outdoor museum in Roseville a couple of weeks ago. And they had a little place, they used to have a, a roundhouse there for the, for the, it used to be a stop for the railroad. And it said on one of the little pl informational plaques that to get one engine in the 1800s over Donner Pass took 16 cords of wood. Now, for those of you guys that ever heated with wood, 16 cords is a lot of wood, and that means a lot of trees are coming down. So our discussion today is about roads. Um, and remember, and this sort of brings a lot of it together. And we're basically gonna start from 1841 and we're gonna finish now. And it pretty much goes to the present. So we're gonna take sort of the whole gamut of time here. Okay, to start the content, uh, we're gonna review, we're gonna talk about Dog Valley, uh, which is a place everybody should go and nobody does. Uh, we'll talk about the Don Dutch Flat, Donner Lake Toll Road, the Lincoln Highway and underpasses old and new, um, the Victory Highway, see lots of highways. Highway 40 and the Donner Summit Bridge, Highway 80, airports, air roads, and arrows, and probably some more stuff that's not even in there. Um, this picture, by the way, is from the top of Red Mountain. And this structure up here was put up by the railroad. And it's pretty old, it's in from the 1800s. And the function of this structure is to watch the railroad, which is way down here. You can see it down here, it's way below and it's to watch for fires. And the people up there had a communication system and if they saw a fire, they would call down and then they would get the people out on it to um, put the fire out. Um, a fire is not good when you have a whole, when you have 35 miles of wooden snow sheds, which is what they had for quite a while. So that's what Red Mountain's for. You can go there, by the way. Uh, you can, apparently it's a nasty hike. It was nasty enough, I never wanted to do it. You can also, if you get a four wheel drive vehicle, you can go up there, and if you don't want to do either, you can look it up on YouTube, put in Red Mountain, and um, if you mess around a while, you will find it. Not, nice place to be up there, very interesting place to be. Nice view, you can see the American River Canyon up there. Way up there, okay. We saw this in week one, I wanted to bring this back um, because it's got some really significant, heavy information that you didn't know already. Donner Pass is narrow. So keep that in mind as we go through the next hour and a half or so. If you recall, it just goes from here to there. And these things are off. There's, here's the railroad. Here's the roads, one of the roads we're gonna talk about. 
Gears Highway 40, which we're going to talk about. And so there's not a whole lot of room. And um, because of the lack of room, it sort of causes me a problem. And here's, here's my solution to my problem here. I'll explain the problem and explain the solution. Or maybe I'll explain the solution first. Um, we're not going to do recipes today um, because of the fact that, as we talked about last week, the famous Tom, Tom Cruise um, quote, I feel the need for speed. Well, everybody wanted to go faster. Everybody did. So they kept making, they kept making roads. And I could not explain them where they were without doing this. This is my analogy to the roads. Think of a bunch of pancakes. And we're going to start from the bottom from the oldest. The oldest started in 1840, 1844, excuse me, not 1841. Dog Valley was the first after the, after the immigrant trails. Then we go Dutch Flat, Donner Lake Toll Road. Then the Lincoln Highway blew in. Then the Victory Highway blew in. Then Highway 40 blew in. Interstate 80, which I guess if you want to be really um, symbolic, if you're an ex-English major or something like I am, um, it could be the, the syrup on top. And then finally on top, is the air highway we actually get into aeronautics today. So when we look at all these roads, and if it gets a little confusing, because it gets a little bit confusing to me, it's basically they're just piled up on top of each other like a bunch of pancakes because the pass is so narrow. Um, and re really the whole, if you remember we talked about the long, long gradual um, land, uh, landscape up there, it's very narrow and you gotta put it in, you gotta put it where it's easy to make the road. So that's what they did. Um, in addition to the past being there, keep in mind other things we had to review. Talk a little bit about coming from the east, it's a cliff, it's very steep. That comes into play today with the railroad and the highways and, and the Interstate 80. It all kind of comes into play again. You never get too, too far from topography on Donner Pass. So let's, let's forge on here. Okay, the continual search for speed. Think way back to Stevens, Towns, and Murphy. And see. We should probably do more for St. Patrick's Day. It seems like everybody has a brother's name's Murphy on this road. Anyway, um, we went back to my relatives way back when. And if you recall, they took, they followed the Truckee River, which pretty much is basically what Highway 80 follows. So they took this route. They just followed the road up and they went all the way up past Boca and Verde and whatever else and finally got up here to Truckee. Uh, the interesting thing is it was so slow that they averaged two miles a day two miles per day when they used it. It was not the way you wanted to go. It was not the way you wanted to go. Um, so because it was not the way you wanted to go, it was too slow. Caleb Greenwood, who was with the Stevens, Townsend, Murphy party, this guy's 80 year old guy going across the, um, the country on a horse. Just can imagine. Anyway, um, so in 1844, 45, Caleb Greenwood was in the Stevens, Townsend, Murphy party and they came east. He got to California. And the first thing he tried to figure out was he didn't like doing the Truckee River. So he found when on the way back, these guys just go back and forth. On the way back, he um, took a different route. He scouted around and find the Dog Valley Bypass, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and this is Dog Valley out here. You can take, this is the um, Dog Valley Bypass Road. You can go out there. It is a great place to go. Um, it's a great place to go. What he did was he found it. Um, and the, um, it was used later. He found it, he went back to Fort Hall, which is where all the um, immigrants would go past. And he'd go past and say, hey, why don't you take this route? This is faster for you and everything else. And then he would um, graciously offer his paid services to guide people west. So he invented the Dog Valley route. The Dog Valley route is still there. The Dog Valley route got used by everybody. It is still there. And Dog Valley, you wanna go someplace where you're really nowhere, but, you, but you're close, you go back there and it is, we were back there and we took, a wrong, we took a wrong turn and it was like, wow, this is like, this defines nowhere. Um, we'll talk about it in places to go. Interesting place to go, easy place to get to, easy place to get to. So they had the Dog Valley Road, um, which is the way the Donners, by the way, got to um, where Donner State Park is. They did not go up the Truckee River. He had already made that plain to people that you, the, he already established the Don, um, Dog Valley Route and the Donners went. Um, went that route, which is why um, George Donner and his brother got stuck way out in Alder Creek, because that's the way you come in from Dog Valley. Okay, um, then we get the initial, the road with all the initials, the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road, the DFDLTR. Um, 
And we'll go back to the big four. Uh, in the 1860s, they're making the railroad. And if you recall, they had to go through, go through the Sierra drilling 15 tunnels, okay? The problem with 15 tunnels and specifically the last tunnel at the top, the last tunnel was you get stuck, you can't move. And remember how they got money? One of the major ways they got money to finance the road is mile by mile. If you recall the uh, Hagen, Hagen Oaks golf course where the Sierra really started according to, um, according to the, the big four and where they started getting paid $32 or $48,000, yeah, $48,000 a mile. When they're stuck going one foot a day um, over tunnel six, they're not making any money. So what they've decided to do, they had the railroad all the way up to what is now Cisco Grove. They took the railroad to there and they made the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road, um, which they had oxen up there and horses and all sorts of stuff. You can see the picture there. And they pulled, they pulled engines up there. They pulled equipment up there and they went right over Donner Pass, um, bypassing the tunnel and started working out in the desert. Anything to get more miles in um, and, that, and to speed it up. And in fact, they were in a race with the uh, Union Pacific is one thing, but they weren't making any money. So they went out to the flat desert and you can go faster and then you can make money. And they actually would take the engines apart, bring them around South America, bring them up to San Francisco, put them on a boat, another boat, take them to Sacramento, put them on the railroad, take them up to Cisco Grove and put them on a wagon and take, and take them across. It took them 15 months to make that tunnel and they were doing that all that time and before they were doing that. So they used that a lot. A lot of people went to the silver mines in Nevada. Uh, it was a big deal. There was some rumor that they were gonna stop. They were just gonna stop the railroad at the end of California and just use this trail to get to the, the mines because um, the mine was so successful, but they kept going. So this is 1860s and you can see the road, you know, as the road go, as roads go. And it was very crowded. Um, you had to wait to get on it in a lot of times. Um, and it's still there. You can wander around there to show you that in a little bit too. Everything is still there uh, if you wanna look for it. So that's the Dutch Flat Donnelly Toll Road. And this is another, this is like a place you wanna hang out. This is on the other side, uh, west of Big Bend. And you can see the immigrant trail marker. This was, this was the immigrant trail. It was the Dutch Flat Donnelly Toll Road. It was the Lincoln Highway, which came later. They just, think of the pancakes, they just smack one on top of the other because there isn't that much, many places to go. Uh, of, of a little bit of notice is if you start finding out about trails and stuff, this looks a little bit of it, you will find, if you find the immigrant trail or find any trail really, the, um, one of the ways you tell is that rocks are thrown to the side. And I'm guessing that these rocks were probably right here, were probably thrown or pushed to the side. You can see there's more rocks over here and there's better pit examples of it later. But the trail went right that way, according to that sign. And they would, that's how you tell sometimes where the trail is good evidence they throw the rocks away. Um, on the way up to Tunnel 6, the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road went through Summit Valley. And if you notice, this is the actual wagon wheel markers of that road. And the story is, I think it's half true. Well, you know, they, they, were, so, they were so heavy and there were so many wagons, they just took, took the, um, the dirt and compressed it so much that stuff can't even grow. Well, stuff's starting to grow. And one of the reasons stuff didn't grow was this is underwater for, it was um, Lake Van Norden. So this was underwater for quite a while. But um, the point is made, there was a lot of traffic, quite a bit of traffic. And the traffic was not going to Donner Pass anymore. Donner Pass is way over here. Roller Pass is over here. And they did Coldstream Pass right here. They came over Coldstream, which we'll talk about in a second too. But that was when they used, they did use Donner sometimes too, um, but Roller was way over here. That's not what they wanted to do. So they used to use two of them. Um, and you can walk on this too. It's a nice walk. Nice walk out in the middle of the valley out there. Now, this is where I, re I realized I, I'm gifted in some ways, very few ways. Years and years and years ago, I was walking up the Pacific Crest Trail, which is cleverly marked by an arrow here. I was walking up the Pacific Crest Trail and I looked down and I saw this, right? I remember these rocks and this sort of this opening. I thought, wow, 
that kind of looks like a trail. Well, that's the, what the thinking is. That was the way up and over um, Coldstream Cold Stream Pass. Um, and the in, immigrants used it also. Uh, one of the ways they still used it somewhat, but this was the Dutch Flat and the Hunter Lake Toll Road going over. And we'll get to this in, in, at the end a little bit. This is going to sound like heresy, and it is. I mean, I would get drummed out of wherever I'm, whatever I'm in, I would get drummed out. Um, as horrible as a forest fire would be right there, it would be the most magnificent thing for one reason. You'd find trails all over the place. The trails come out of the woodwork when you have a forest fire. Please don't start writing letters in. I don't want to have forest fires, but you'll see in a little bit, a little bit later, what forest fires can do as far as um, evidence of what, what took place before, what used to be overgrown and so on. But this really is, it's there. And I remember thinking, boy, yeah, I'd have a fire dream. You could really see it. So that's the Pacific Coast Trails there. And that probably is part of the D DFDLTR route, probably is. Okay, so. To talk about that trail, you need to talk about, well, let's zip it along here, um, Cisco's. There were two Cisco's. Right now, if you know, if you think of Cisco, you think of Cisco Grove, which is an off-ramp and a little kind of retirement place, some retirement homes right on Highway 40. And we're going to talk about lower Cisco. This is Cisco Grove, okay? Upper Cisco, you don't think of anymore because it's not there. Evidence is there but it's not there. And it must've been pretty substantial. This, assuming this is somewhat of a representation of what was there, they must have some, some um, homes, shops for the railroad and so on. So a lot of stuff was going on and the railroad, as you can see, goes right through it. It goes right through, it goes, it goes this way. Um, Cisco Grove gets the Dutch Flat Road, which becomes Highway 40 later. Um, but this is all railroad up here. This is Upper Cisco. Um, which I'll show you in a minute how you can, get, well, I'll show you later how you can get up there. So the Upper Cisco. So this is Cisco in its prime. You can see the buildings. Whoops, where'd we go? Sorry. Um, again, until the railroad was completed, as it says in the bottom left, this thing boomed. Um, you see all the, all the buildings over here. See, this is all snow sheds. They covered it all um, because they, had just, they just didn't have the equipment to deal with the snow which took, probably took care of a whole lot of trees too. So it was up here, the town was down to the right here. This is the town, That's, I guess this is when they used to have snow. So they had a lot there. And you can see another view of the town over here. And it did boom, that was the end of the line. Trains would bring everything up, deposit them and put them on wagons and they would start moving. So a lot of stuff was going on there. If you wanna go up there, it's easy to do. I'll tell you, probably tell you twice today. This is Cisco, California in, the, in 2020. I was up there last July. Um, and you know where to go. Um, you start seeing stuff, not much. You see some of this stuff, probably from the roundhouse and the great railroad equipment, uh, roofs of buildings, get some more railroad stuff. Again, evidence that there's a road right here. There's a road right here. There's lots of plumbing up there, just stuff. Um, this is where all those buildings used to be. When, you, when you're up there wandering around, I encourage you to do that as I always do, you find something that flat, that's not, that's not nature's, not likely made by nature, man made that. So that's what kind of where the buildings were. And it's flat, you walk around and see stuff. We found um, pieces of pottery up there, um, which by the way, you're supposed to leave. I don't know who does, but um, the Antiquities Act says you can't take anything out of these places. Um, which I never quite understood. I, I, I still try to figure it out if something is buried and then you find it and rebury it. What is the sense? But I'm sure smarter people than me have figured it out. And the best part is between this flat spot and next to the flats, down the hill from here is the railroad. And a train came by and we were there. Always exciting. It's the darnest thing. I may be a Septuagenarian, an old guy now. The train comes by, it's always hot stuff. So I enjoy the train coming by. And he, he yelled something. I assume he wasn't yelling at me, but um, I just assume he wasn't. Okay, so that's there. You can get there. It's really easy to get there. I'll explain it twice. Right now, you basically go up, take the Cisco Road, Cisco off ramp. You get to this gigantic mini mart with a whole lot of trucks. You drive right past that, dodging the trucks, and there are a lot of trucks. And you go, there's only one mini mart, and you go right past the sign that says no trespassing. You just blow past that, 
and you take a bumpy road up about a quarter mile and you get here and then you get to wander around. And I've never been up there when somebody else wasn't there. Um, like bloggers, railroad guys, somebody's always up there. So interesting place to go. And, and you can look around and find stuff, see who was there. Now, that's, that's where the railroad was. Okay, now we're gonna go down to Cisco Grove, which is north of this now. Cisco Grove is, as we'll see in a second, just some houses and old buildings and ruins. But in its prime, had some stuff going on here. Give shot, uh, aliens, um, seems like lots of aliens are around. So apparently in Cisco Grove, it has its share of aliens. I'm not quite sure of where they came from or what the story is, but there's people who believe they're aliens wandering around Cisco Grove. Um, and keep in mind, this is, again, this is Highway 40 at this point. Why all that's there, it's because the cars didn't last as long. They didn't go as far. Um, and they just weren't as reliable. So you had to have more services and they had them there. Uh, these are all gone. All this stuff is gone. What's left is this. These old things are sort of, they're, they're deserted, but they are there. I assume the aliens must still be there too. Um, so you can see this, this is visible as you, once you get off Highway 80. And again, this is again, lower Cisco Grove. I suppose it should be Northern Cisco Grove. I think it's lower because this elevation is lower. And again, these buildings here, they were gift shops now. They got a plaque in front of them and they're closed off. And if you drive really slowly on Highway, Highway 40, you'll pass bicyclists because don't forget, this is the long, easy grade from the West. So it's a much easier place to drive your car, much easier place to ride a bike. But if you go really slow and look mostly to the left as you're going east, you start seeing stuff, just kind of stuff that's from other houses. You see old outdoor woods, outdoor stove, or outdoor chimneys, fireplaces, and this kind of stuff. It's just, it's just there and you just go very slowly and you can see it. Um, did that in October, nice weather, it was very nice. So that's Cisco, that's what's left from the sign is Cisco Grove. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy. And then the, the problems are gonna start now. So I'll read this to you. I like my prose. After the completion of the railroad, the DFDLTR is obsolete because you don't need it anymore. They let the railroad now. They want people to put stuff on the railroad. The toll road is unnecessary. So it falls into disrepair. I'm sure some people used it, but it just sort of fought, fell apart. Until the automobile shows up, DFD LTR becomes part of the highway, snow and all. And you can see this guy. Um, I used to live in the snow, and I'm sure lots of you did too. That strikes me is the most nightmarish. This guy's going to die. He doesn't, but you, this, this, you do this stunt, you're going to be out of here. Um, and it's funny about the railroad. The railroad is always there. It's the 800 pound gorilla in the room, it is always there. Okay, so the DFL, DFD LTR becomes part of the highway, so it's the highway, highway 40 is on top of it. This is not seen as a good solution. And law of unintended consequences, which is on the next slide. Actions of people and especially of governments always have effects that are unintended, which is probably the, that's one and one is two, but boy, is it true, it is true. So let's see what happens here. Snowsheds. Then we talked about 40, 35 to 40 miles of snowsheds to get the snow off the tracks. Now, um, made to solve that problem, become the problem in the early 20th century. Here's what the problem is. This would be a snowshed, a lot of construction there. I mean, that's big stuff. And here's the way through. Unfortunately, you have to go through the snowshed. So here's what you do. Out across the railroad on Donner Summit prior to, prior to 1913. Drive up in a Model T or something fancier. I don't know why they said that, but they did. The tracks are covered by a snowshed, so the tracks are right in there. Open the barn door on one side. Well, you can tell this is a long time ago. You couldn't get away with doing that now to save your life. There's a barn door there. You can probably slide it open. Maybe it's on hinges. Looks like it might be on hinges. You are on the downslope from the summit for trains going east. So this is below the summit. Um, and they're going faster. So when they come this way, they're going faster. Look for trains east and west. It's like when you're in school, look both ways when you cross the street, walk across the tracks. Open the barn door on the other side. Check for trains again before recrossing the tracks. If there are no trains coming, if there are no, tra if there are no trains coming, you run back, crank the motor on your car, it's running, run around to the driver's seat and hop in. And over the noise of the auto engine, you can't hear approaching trains that are gaining speed downhill, but you floor it 
and you go across the railroad tracks and then, and then you close then you close the gate then you close the doors again so that's what you do and right now i know what you're thinking because i thought of it too the definition of inevitable fj mopin and rl douglas are hit by a freight train last Sunday night as they were attempting to go through the snow sheds in a 19, new 1940 Stutz automobile. Um, this was very common. They weren't crossing it. They were in them. They were driving on it uh, because it's too snowy. So you just get, it's a perfect tunnel and they would drive on, on the tracks. They've had motorcyclists go through here. Uh, bicyclists would go through. It's easy. You can go through in the middle of winter. So they were on the tracks and a train came by and caught them and hit them and they both survived. I cannot believe they both survived. It was probably going pretty, I assume it was going slowly. This was not the only incident. And um, the way you work it is guys, bicyclists will go across or motorcyclists, first of all, and they would say, you listen. And you gotta understand there's melting snow in there. There's also, it's weird smoke, it's smoky, it smells, you can't see, it's dark. And you listen and when you hear it coming, you basically get off your bike and you press yourself against the side of that snowshed and suck your gut in and, and that, that train is close. That train is close. And that's what they did for a long time. I'm sure they took the snowsheds down. They kind of ruined a lot of people's fun. But anyway, so that is the definition of an inevitable. Once they had that snowsheds there, you figure this was gonna happen sooner or later, but they did survive. You One know, guy didn't do too well, but he survived. Yes, ma'am? Um, you know, the, the gray box that, you know, you can see the folks Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it is hitting a lot of your slides. Do I lose it or do you lose it? Well, I think that um, that we would want to see the slides. Go ahead. Yeah, how do we do it? Okay, go to your uh, your options and yeah. just and then hide the gallery. Okay. My, my question always is get my options back, Lori. Let's see. Yeah, it's up at the top. Nope, nope. It's up at the top. Top it's of the not screen. Up here. Hit escape. Oh, escape. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So if you could I'm just hit. Unfortunately, um, I it, video it is. Yeah. See you guys. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. It's just, it was fun it's, seeing it's people for a while. Okay. That's okay. fine. And then if you could hide your toolbar too. Oh, yeah. Dude, I got to do everything in this class. I know. Ah. Thank you. It's, this I'm class is great. This. I'm only gonna take this one more week. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we got this problem going on. You got a, a difficult, a difficult surface to drive on because you might get killed. Uh, it's muddy. It's wet. It's snowy. It's everything bad. And so people who were thinking, and this is Carl Fisher. Carl Fisher's a famous thinker, at least as far as highways went. He decided to invent the Lincoln Highway about 1913, and he was the guy. If you look down here. They used to have, a, I swear, they used to have um, some ad on TV that the, the catch line was body by Fisher. Well, this was Carl Fisher. So Carl Fisher sort of established the Lincoln Highway Association. And you see, he worked on cars, tires, accessories, just was involved in the industry. And the goals, well, this isn't the only goal. The goals were signs, a hard surface all the way across the country in 20 years, and all year roads by the 1930s. And there should be one more goal there, which says, and I'll make way more money because they'll, people will be having more cars, driving more, and uh, will sell more parts and so on. So new roads were not the goal. They just used the existing roads. And that's just Carl Fisher's idea. And Lincoln Highway, which is still around, we'll, we'll see some evidence of it in a second. Um, Carl knew what he was doing. Um, when Carl invented the Lincoln Highway, it wasn't like Carl just found something stupid to do because he had, he had too much time. This is Carl's house. This is in Montauk. And Montauk is famous. One of the reasons famous, that's where Jaws was. Uh, we're actually going to get to Jaws pretty soon, too, in this class. But anyway, this was his house. This was his house in Florida, which looks like it just had a hurricane. It's like they're doing some, some repair. But that was his house. Man, it's disrepair. But anyway, so my, that was his Miami Beach story, or his Miami Beach mansion. And so Carl knew what he was doing. He did okay. And it solved some problems. And this is a solution to a problem you can see again. Uh, in the early years, remember, the, remember the, snow, the snow sheds and getting through them. It was just a real problem here. You can see right here what they did. Uh, the snow sheds are gone now <coughs> because they can get they have better snow removing technology. They have much better engines, stronger engines, and the technology is better. 
but they made this underpass. They actually made through, they went right through it. They didn't go over it, they dug underneath it. And um, I'm sure if I said this was the first overpass in the history or underpass in the history of the United States, somebody will find out that it wasn't. So I said one of the first, because I'm gonna cover my tail here. This is one of the first, this is also right where the immigrant trail went through. And so cars would drive here, railroad cars would drive there, the immigrant trail came through there, um, certainly not when the underpass was there, but um, same place, there's only one place to get through. And it, actually, if you take that, I always refer back to that parking lot and walking through the tunnel. If you walk through that tunnel, you walk right over this. So once again, when you do something crazy up there in summer, park over there, park at the end of tunnel six. So, and this is still there, it's now an art gallery, but that's a whole nother story. Okay, so Lincoln Highway did a lot of things. Um, it modernized and it abandoned, modernized and abandoned on Donner Pass. You can see the Lincoln Highway became Highway 40, or they used it for Highway 40 later. So this was the road they ended up doing. But if you look around, again, if you're up there above the underpass, if you look down, you can see these roads down there. And it's probably part of the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road, probably part of the Lincoln Highway, uh, part of the Immigrant Trail. It's all the same, think of the pancakes. And again, this is the other side. This is when you walk out of, um, I think I mentioned um, going up Summit Canyon. This is what you walk on. And you can see it's obviously a road. I mean, there's no, all of a sudden there's empty space right there. Um, it must've been one nasty ride though. God, I can't imagine. Now I'm sure there it's been eroded by the water for quite well, over a hundred years, but it must not have been exactly a lot of laughs. So you can walk on this stuff too. You can do that. And then to the West, that was to the East of the pass. This is to the West. And this is right off Highway 80. You can see the Yuba River's right here. This is the um, this is Highway 40. This is the older part of the Lincoln Highway. We've got lots of rock work there. You can see here the another version. This is all retaining walls made um, in the construction of the Lincoln Highway. And you can and this is also on the Immigrant Trail too. So you can walk on this stuff. You can ride your bike. Um, you can even drive. You know where to get on. Um, so it, it's all it's all still there. It's amazing when you get up there, not much changes and not much is not much is not much leaves or disappear. It's still there. And more Lincoln Highway. If you recall the um, Secret Town Trestle last week, which I'm still having trouble getting my head wrapped around. This is the way to the Secret Town Trestle, which is the Lincoln Highway. These, if you don't know, these are Lincoln Highway markers. This is the end of the trestle. Another Lincoln Highway goes right underneath it. And this is at Big Bend. Again, another Lincoln Highway marker and this you see these all over the country they go from new york city all the way to san francisco and there's they're they're pretty much um still there people still people still mark them and there's the whole big um school of um research on that a lot of people interested in it a lot of people go driving around to see it okay so lincoln highway was not only went to the west it went to the east so this is dog valley remember caleb greenwood caleb greenwood um, made the route to avoid the Truckee River. Well, they didn't want to go in the Truckee River either, and there was no route there, so they just, they used routes that were there. So they used the old um, um, Dog Valley Road, which was the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road, which went out to the mines in Nevada. This is kind of what it looks like now. I'm sure that you can't really see that vehicle well enough to see what year it is or how, what era it's from. But a lot of it is this, it's not hard to drive. <coughs> it is not hard to drive. You just have to know where it is when you get on it. It leads you right back to Truckee, uh, which is over here to the right. Uh, this, uh, this is striking to me. If you've ever been to Bodie, which is south, a couple hours south of this, this reminds me of Bodie. Uh, I can imagine in the spring, this must have been one of the great swamps in the Western world. What a mess. But you can see the services. There's a gas station right there. I believe that's a saloon right there. A lovely looking place. Um, this building might still be there. I'm not quite sure. Some are still there. Anyway, so this is Truckee and the immigrant, or excuse me, the Dog Valley Road and the um, Lincoln Highway, of which this probably is part of it, goes right through it. So that'd be Lincoln Highway, still there. Well, that wasn't good enough either. So um, Lincoln Highway was started in 1913. And then we had World War One after that. So some people have had the idea of them. we'll just make a memorial type highway. So they started the Victory Highway, which pretty much was the Lincoln Highway. 
uh, but a little different than what they tried to do. By 1923, and the theory was, thinking was the National Memorial Highway honoring World War I veterans. And what they wanted to do was raise money to put one of these um, at each county line in the country. You can see if I can do this right. I love doing this, it's my favorite thing. So I don't wanna do it in yellow. Anyway, well, we'll do it in yellow, right there. This is the border of California and Nevada. And that's, this eagle is that eagle. They moved it, they moved it. So this is right on the border and Nevada. And I think they said they called it gold state over here, excuse me, gold state over here, silver state over here. The interesting thing is, and I'm not a math guy, and I'm sure somebody listening to me is right now, but ponder this for a second. So as I said up there, the fundraising to build a monument at each county line in, in the country. Now, there's 3,141 counties. I looked that up, so on the, I read it on the internet. It must be true. Now, let's say every county there has one county that butts up to it. Okay, so that's, yeah, uh, let's say two. So that's over 6,000 interact intersections of counties. And if they want to put a monument at each section, that's 6,000 monuments, which is the reason they only have 10. There's only 10 that are now known. Okay, they have 10, one of which is right there. And one of which isn't very far away, we'll talk about a little bit too. Uh, the Victory Highway followed the Lincoln Highway route. And again, this is at the border and they moved it to here. So that was the, that was the Victory Highway. Yeah, didn't get much play, you don't hear much about it. There's no books about it. Lots of books about the Lincoln Highway, but the Victory Highway is pretty much kind of a sort of a lost, a lot, kind of a lost soul kind of thing. Um, some in California though, and I'll stop for a second. Anybody know where these are? Put your hand up if you know. Show, show everybody how smart you are. These are both in California. Maybe recognize them? I know there's somebody out there. I can't see anymore. Just Okay, Lawrence, we'll wait. Yes, ma'am. No, Ron, Ron's hand is up. Ron, do you want to? The one on the right is in Truckee on Donner Pass Road. That is correct. The one on the right is right in front of a bank. I think we used to, or at least it used to be at some building, not a bank. That's so on Donner Pass Road. It's in truck building. That's the one that used to be at the border. And then on the left, I'll give you hints. The left clearly has, the one left clearly oh, has wait, a bathroom to be wait, serviced. Wait, we have Judy with her hand up. Okay. Judy, if you want to unmute yourself. Is that in William Land Park? Yes, ma'am, it is. Um, okay. It's on Freeport Boulevard. Yeah which must be the Lincoln Highway too. I don't know if there's, I don't think there's a county line right there, but that's where they put it. So yeah, that exactly where it is. So there's 10 left in the country that know of, and we got eight of them, or we got two of them right here. I knew you guys were alive out there. It's really strange looking at the wall here. Um, you don't know if anybody's there. Yeah, yeah. so there's two. Um, we, we William do have Park, a, Truckee, yes? Uh, we do have a question. Sure. So uh, Tom asked, did Bill already explain what a, a Lincoln Highway sign deficit makes? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you, Laura. Oh, did you explain what a Lincoln High Highway sign designates? What's the last word? Designates. Oh, designates? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. If you, yeah, it basically designates the route of the Lincoln Highway. And you'll find them on walls of businesses, um, on cement, cement um, standards and so on. It just tells you where it was. And the Lincoln Highway, to go back, you follow these, you'll go to San Francisco. If you know if you know where they are, and there's books, I'll show you a book in a little bit. You can follow this all the way to San Francisco. It starts in New York City. So yeah, it just designates where the road was. So this was the road. It must've been wild out there. It just must've been the middle of nowhere. Okay, moving along. This, this is the greatest example of you think you know what you're talking about and then you don't. Uh, here's Highway 40 and the Donner Summit Bridge. And this is co commonly called the Rainbow Bridge. I think officially it's the Donner Memorial Bridge, actually. I think that's the official, the official name of it. I'm going to stop doing highlighter. There we go. So this is officially called the Donner um, Memorial Bridge. And they call it Rainbow because of this. And it's interesting. This is kind of a famous bridge. Okay. And what the reason they made it this used to be a gravel road and logging trucks specifically would be coming down here. And you know, logging trucks are big. 
Uh, if you ever lived in one of those logging trucks, you get off the road when they're coming. Well, they were having a tough time doing the Lincoln, doing the Lincoln Highway the way it used to be on that little skinny, scrawny road. So they made this, um, and they made this, and the curve is easier. It's a nice big curve. This is, if any famousness, there's such a word, no, um, the opposite of notoriety, any, any, any um, I guess notoriety, I suppose, is, is in this bridge because this end is lower than this end. It's going uphill, and it's built on a curve. Apparently, bridge builders don't do that much. Um, so that's, that's the reason it's famous, other than the fact that at the right-hand side, there's a big turnout where you can go look down on the lake and stuff, but by and large, that's why it's famous. It's also famous a few years ago because a bear was crossing the road. Um, was A car came, the bear ran to get off and fell off the bridge and got stuck right there. So it stayed there overnight. It was on the bridge overnight and stayed there. And they had a big rescue thing where they basically ended up putting nets underneath the bear, shot the bear with a tranquilizer dart. The bear fell into the net. They lowered the bear and the bear woke, off, woke up and walked away. That's kind of what he's famous for too. My favorite part is the, when, when they rebuilt it. They rebuilt it in 93 because it that's a tough place to have a bridge. You got temperature problems, you got all sorts of stuff. Um, so they said, and they made it pretty exactly. There are a whole lot of ideas. Fill this in, make a road, um, close the whole thing. Don't even, don't even have anything there. So they decided to do, to reproduce it. And they said the only change in the 90s was to, was to close up the railings because people were getting their heads stuck. So people would put their heads through the railings and get them stuck. I've done many dumb things in my life. I never pondered doing that. Okay. So, and this was a guy named Norman Rapp, and he worked for the state. And I thought, hey, this must, what a great bridge. This must, this must be his, his moment, his creation. This is what put him on the map. So I, I was talking about that. And then I started thinking about stuff. Wow. Name of that is the Bixby Bridge. Big Sur, see that all the time, TV commercials. Yuba River, you can take this hike. There's a fantastic river canyon right there. Been down there, taking a hike. So you got the same kind of bridge. Now that's the, the, the um, rainbow and the standards going up and down. Orangevale, those of you living, I didn't realize this is now a walking trail. I didn't know that existed. And Redding's got one too, right across the Sacramento River. So I'm thinking there must be more than more than what I thought. And I found a couple more. Folsom's got one, obviously. And then my friend Nancy was in this class. I think now she's picking up her grandchildren. She sends me this picture the day after class. She's taken the class twice. She's, I guess it was too hard the first time. Uh, she sends me this picture of um, Cold Springs Canyon near Santa Barbara. So I get this picture the day, the afternoon of the the class last semester. And I'm thinking, boy, maybe there's more of these bridges than I thought. Man, I shot my mouth off and talked about how rare they were and stuff. So I started looking around and I came across this. They're called open spandrel arches. There's 741 of them. And this is where they are in the United States. I don't know what the problem in North Dakota is. Seems to be a problem there. Louisiana doesn't have one either, but by and large, everybody else does. And again, called open spandrel arches. And here's the definition. Open spandrel arch also has a vertically curved concrete slab with open vertical columns supporting four beams and a deck slab. In other words, you got this. Here's, this is where all the weight goes. You got these things supporting the deck slab. And so next time somebody says, boy, that's a rare bridge, maybe not. And the, you wanna, if you got time on your hands, Maybe you have less time now. COVID's kind of ending. Nebraska didn't have one either. Um, there's www.bridgehunter.com. There is more weird stuff on that. You can find about your bridge down the street. I found all, all sorts of bridges. Um, and they give you a little history. You can see what they used to look like, um, how, they made, how, much they, how, how they made them, how old they are, and so on. Pretty interesting stuff. Pretty interesting stuff. I got this from Ohio, this particular um, slide. But bridgehunter.com, and there's 741 open spandrel arches. As a matter of fact, the other day, for those, if any of you take the engineering class, um, which is a really fascinating class, I swear the new bridge over Hoover Dam is reminiscent of an open spandrel arch. And I found myself thinking, boy, what does it tell you about it when you can look at a bridge and, and go, that looks like an open spandrel arch. My wife was unimpressed. Um, I don't know why. Okay, from dirt to asphalt. This is your um, state of California spending its money well. This is a, if, if you go to Donner State Park, 
um, down Memorial State Park, you can see this video. So we're gonna show this a little bit. It talks about the roads too. It's a pretty good video. I enjoy it. So spend some time on this. <music> We're driving on Old Highway 40, just approaching Donner Pass. This is one of America's most historic highways, and we're driving it in this beautiful 1929 Ford Model A. It's the perfect way to revisit the wild early days of motoring over the Sierra. When you drive up Donner Pass Road, the first thing that you notice is the magnificent scenery. You have the majestic mountain pass and the breathtaking views of Donner Lake. But more importantly, as you stop to get out and stretch your legs, you'll be walking on some of the most historically significant ground in the state. Because for thousands of years, any traffic that came across the Sierra here, whether by foot, by rail, or by road, had to come through this narrow gap. Standing here, we have history laid out before us. At our feet are the petroglyphs, which are images created by the Native Americans nearly 4,000 years ago. Below us is the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Wagon Road, which essentially follows the same route immigrants took in the 1800s. And above us, we have the tunnels and the massive China Wall built by the Chinese laborers for the Transcontinental Railroad. This old wagon road was originally constructed to service the railroad, but fell into disrepair. So in the early 1900s, when motor vehicles first attempted to cross the Sierra, it proved to be an extremely dangerous and potentially deadly undertaking. But despite the dangers, crossing the Sierra by car presented an irresistible challenge to the early autoists a new breed of adventurers intent upon pushing their newfound mobility to the limit. The first to make it over in 1902 was George Wyman on a motorcycle. He was followed the next year by Alexander Winton driving a car he built from a kit. It must have been a bumpy ride. In 1909, an informal race from Sacramento to Lake Tahoe was won by H.W. Smith of Sacramento driving an EFM-3 Roadster. The next year, the challenge was formalized in the Valvoline Sacramento to Tahoe race, which attracted a fanatical group of daredevils prepared to go to any lengths to secure the trophy. In June of 1911, George Starr and Arthur Foote of Grass Valley, together with four passengers, drove, hauled, and hoisted their Ford Model T Roadster through record snowpack over swollen rivers and seemingly impassable terrain to win the Tahoe Tavern Silver Cup race. As automobile ownership soared across the nation, there was growing interest in establishing a transcontinental highway. The route that became known as the Lincoln Highway was stitched together from stretches of road and track from New York's Times Square to Lincoln Park in San Francisco, crossing the Sierra Nevada at Donner Pass. The visionary behind the endeavor was auto racer and entrepreneur Carl G. Fisher, who convened the first meeting of the Lincoln Highway Association on July 1st, 1913. The automobile won't get anywhere until it has good roads to run on. The highway will stimulate as nothing else could the building of enduring highways everywhere that will mean much to American agriculture and commerce. Fisher's dream was to have the road completed by May 1st, 1915. He told potential investors Let's build it before we get too old to enjoy it. The proposed route was dedicated on October 31st, 1913 and celebrated with bonfires, fireworks and parades in hundreds of cities in the 13 states along the line. But it wasn't until September 1st, 1928 that the Lincoln Highway, affectionately known as the main street across America was officially marked and dedicated to the memory of Abraham Lincoln by 3,000 members of the Boy Scouts of America. 
We can still find their markers on many highways across the country, including some sections of old road like this here at Big Bend. Car ownership was rapidly becoming part of the American dream and road improvement became a priority everywhere. Just a few years after the Lincoln Highway was dedicated, it was replaced by US Highway 40, ushering in a new era of travel and tourism over Donner Pass. Undoubtedly the most spectacular feature on Old Highway 40 is the Donner Memorial Bridge, referred to as the Rainbow Bridge. Built in 1926, it's an iconic feat of engineering and one of the most photographed bridges in California besides the Golden Gate. To cater to the needs of travelers along the route, small communities sprang up around motor courts, inns, and lodges. The growth of the skiing industry meant that mountain roads were now kept open year-round, and for the next 30 years or so, these businesses flourished. But just as quickly as it arrived, this new way of life would soon be bypassed by progress. This beautifully rebuilt Flying A service station in Truckee is a wonderful reminder of the golden age of motoring around Donner Pass. In the early 1950s, as America recovered from the Second World War, President Eisenhower unveiled his grand plan for the nation's highways, creating the interstate highway system we know today. With the opening of I-80 in 1960, Many of the small communities and businesses along Highway 40 rapidly disappeared as travelers bypassed the local attractions and chose reliable chain hotels and motels close to the interstate. The glory days of old Highway 40 are long gone, but much of it is still drivable today. You can still discover many treasures of the past along the way and experience the fascinating story of one of the most historic and beautiful stretches of road in the nation. see that at the museum at Don Memorial State Park. Um, good summary of it. Um, when you saw the part, I think they mentioned Baxter and Baxter, I think they had a hotel there and stuff. The sad part is when you drive up Highway 80, all those little places you see the signs for, I think one went through Clipper Gap and all these ones you see the signs, there's nothing there. It's because they they were, taken, they were taken away when the interstate came. So I thought I would inter, inter, introduce the um, discussion of Interstate 80 with a one minute musical interlude. So hang on for one minute and understand the symbolism here. For those of you who just who figured out, as you probably know, that's the theme. That's John Williams and the theme from Jaws, 
And believe me, one, at least one person in this audience just said, how is that clown going to connect Interstate 80 to a shark? Um, well, this clown's not going to do that. Um, it was sort of a symbolic thing. But believe me, if you're Highway 40, Interstate 80, and the pictures of construction right here, it was jaws to you. It was going to destroy. It, it was going to destroy the economy of Highway 40, which it pretty much, if it hasn't destroyed it, it sure put a knock on it. Um, but it's interesting to look at these pictures. This is the early 60s. Remember we talked about the long grades, the easy grades coming from the West. God, what a place to do a freeway in the mountains. It's just, it must have been a cruise to do this. I mean, relative to what it could have been. So this, the freeway, when you get to the top, and when I talk about the top, I'm talking way up by the ski areas before you start going down into Truckee, that's called the Yulin Valley. And that's what all of this is pictures of. Must have been a great place. Must have been a great place, but not anymore. Jaws came. Okay, so Interstate 80. Better go further. Sorry, guys. I always have trouble with videos. There we go. Uh, this is construction again in um, early 60s. This is a great picture as far as tra you know, if we're ever doing a, cl a, cl a class on transportation, everything is in this little picture. Shows you how narrow the transportation corridor was. Um, here's I-80. This is right, this is a little bit west of Big Bend. This is the base of I-80, the bridge, okay? To the right is, to the right is the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road. It's also the Lincoln Highway. It's also the Immigrant Trail. Below it is Highway 40, and this obviously is the Yuba River. It is all there, and of course, what's always there forever is the railroad. So it's all there in the railroad. You can always tell, always a straight line. Heck of a picture. And it must have been a great traffic jam because these guys are all going in one direction. So I imagine the traffic jams must have been a riot up there. Um, yeah, this is all obviously all done now and everything else. So that was I-80 construction, um, which I'm sure must have been interesting on Highway 40, watching it slowly fade away. Um, let's see, we're doing time now. Okay, Interstate 80 um, and what it did to the mountains up there. Uh, I found this study of it. Talk about what's good about freeways. And I'm not an anti-freeway guy for those of you guys that work for Caltrans out there or used to. I'm not trying to rip up the freeway, but it comes with its pros and cons. Clearly it's great for job creation, automotive technology. I got how, the, how much better the cars are, getting the stuff faster. Remember, we're always gonna go faster and easy travel. Um, I always think of, um, I was born and raised in San Jose and my father would tell me he would go to Santa, he would go to Santa Cruz on Highway 9 and vomit the whole way over and vomit the whole way back. When I was a kid, we just did Highway 17, which wasn't, wasn't exactly a lot of laughs, but nobody was heaving all the way across. So much easier travel, uh, easier on your car and so on. And specifically tourism. I would imagine Truckee has done real well by the um, fact that that freeway is there, okay? The cons get a little bit different. They had to use eminent domain. Eminent domain basically says the government wants your property for um, the public good and we will pay you what the, the government will pay you what they think is an appropriate amount. Very controversial. They don't like to do it. Uh, the railroad, because you got freeways, the railroad loses business on at times because the fact that the trucks can go on the railroad. The flyover effect, you just blow right past towns. I can recall any of you guys are from upstate New York. I recall the highway across upstate New York. And I saw signs for um, little villages on both sides of the road, never saw one of them. You just go right past. Um, and there's so much vegetation back there, you couldn't even see them from the road. Uh, traffic congestion, certainly. Freeways are great for traffic. Um, they're supposed to move things faster, but not always. And they do do urban sprawl. They make urban sprawl possible. But probably the biggest one, the one we're talking about here, is the decline of small town America. And that's kind of what's happened. Um, if you really want to see decline of small town America, get out in Route 66 sometime and look at the destroyed, just all the, the destroyed buildings, um, abandoned buildings, they're just falling down. And I, su I assume you can see it any place you want to go. Um, so the highway had some things going for it and had some things that weren't exactly going for it. There's also some myths. I'm here to debunk one myth here. Um, I heard this when I was a kid. Uh, the video mentioned Eisenhower, it was Eisenhower's idea to make the interstate highway system of which I over Donner Pass, Donner Summit is a part. Um, and 
The story is he, he came across in the 20s with the, with the military and was horrified by how hard it was to get across the country. It was a, took him forever, it was a military caravan. After World War II, he saw the Autobahn in Germany and thought that was a great idea. So he decided that he got to that, and there's probably more, a little more to it than that, but to make it easy, he um, <clears throat> put forward the idea of the Interstate Highway Commission. And the myth is, and there's a gentleman in the, there's a highway museum someplace back east, and the guy who runs it, he gets this question all the time about the one in five myth. Well, the one in five myth says every mile, one mile in every five must be straight. And the reason it must be straight and can't have any overpasses is because in case we're attacked, in this case, it was attacked by the Russians, we need places for bombers and air, airplanes to land. And so that was the myth that they would land on the interstate, on the interstate highways. And this is a bomber, obviously. Um, this is not true. This never happened. And you know that because first of all, these um, telephone poles would have been wiped out. <laughs> Um, but it is straight, and it's, somebody obviously photoshopped that, and it's, it's like a 747 um, landing on the highway. Uh, this never happened. You hear about it sometimes. It never did, and hopefully never will. Hopefully never will. And I'm going to stop. Perfect timing. I'm going to stop right there for five minutes, and we'll get back to um, this in a second, and I'll put on five minutes of Irish music for St. Patrick's Day. I'll see you guys in five minutes, 106. On the 4th of July, 1800 and so oh, no. Um, you can chalk this up to trying to do more things than I knew how to do. I thought I'd put a little pl a pleasant interlude of Irish music in honor of St. Patrick's Day. That was the Dubliners. And um, the whole problem was getting rid of this box which I didn't do and I can't because if I do, we're going to go back and do what we did. But we're going to work around this box. Um, anyway, I asked uh, at the end of last class, I asked why didn't the railroad, since this is the freeway and, and the cars come down the freeway and end up right behind this little box, um, why didn't the railroad go this way instead of going this way, which is hard because, let's see if I can show you here, highlighter, black. Oh, well, we'll do it in yellow. The railroad, if you can follow this, goes this way. Pardon the color. And it basically goes behind the Dubliners, ends up right over here, which is exactly where the highway ends up. The highway goes this way. So they end up in the same place, right behind the box. Um, the question is, why didn't, over here you got a canyon. You've got another canyon over here. You've got Coldstream Canyon, which comes all the way back here. They had to go all the way around this. And they, it took, it was longer. It was more difficult. They had tunnels. There's no tunnels over here. Why did they do that? And so I asked the class if anybody had any ideas and two people did, which we'll get to in a second. But the answer is grade and which goes back to topography. And you, if you want to impress your friends, you can, you can impress them with this knowledge. Interstate 80 of the interstate highway system, the maximum grades you can have on any interstate highway um, is 6%. That's why they're not really very steep. Uh, old roads can get steep. You think about when you go to the mountains, the little roads get steep, but the, um, the highway does not. It really does not get very steep. Railroads are a little different ballgame. The railroad maximum grade varies, but it's commonly under 3%. And if you want to know why, we'll think about it for a second. A car can just peel out and get going. A railroad takes a long time. A railroad engine, engines take a long time to get going, and they can't go up hills like, like cars can. So the problem becomes so a train coming down from the summit, coming down from here, might never stop because the grade's too much. So if a train was coming down to here on 6% grade, it would blow right past Truckee. And it might never stop. It probably would end up rolling over in the Truckee River. But if it didn't roll over there, it might not, never stop until Reno because of the fact the grade is too steep. That's why you can only have 3%. So a train coming down from Donner Pass, with all the difficulties they had on Donner Pass, <clears throat> all the difficulties they had on Donner Pass. You're coming at a much lesser angle, about 3%. And considering they probably got four engines, four engines on the train, which is commonly what pulls it over the Sierra. 
So, so that's for not only pulling, but it's also for braking. And you got these canyons, which adds distance, but lets you slow down or lets you pick up speed. So you're going down and this one, this is the great horseshoe, this is the great horseshoe bend. Go all the way in here. This is all about getting speed or losing speed. Um, Cause you, they could have made a bridge right there. They could have easily done that, but it slows you down or picks, or picks it up. And then you get to Truckee without wiping everybody out. And as I said, the bottom down here, less drama and fewer dead people. So it's about grade. And it's just too steep over here. It's not enough distance to slow down. Not enough distance to slow down. So that all being said, I have to congratulate Judy Bell and Beverly Sheehy. They both answered the question. Talk, they answered the question I submitted last week about why, why they the, the, the railroad and the highway chose two different um, paths. So congratulations to you ladies. Thank you for paying attention. And I will say here's, I have big plans for a prize. The, um, the plans for the prize was going to be a $5,000, be a surprise, $5,000 award, actually 10. We were going to have to split it, and you would each get $5,000. Um, I took it to the budget committee of the Renaissance, and they said my budget for this class couldn't quite handle that, so there'd be no um, financial reward for your um, intellectual curiosity. So the only award you're going to get is the one that probably means the most. The rest of the class is going to admire you for your intellectual curiosity and your um, obvious intelligence. Of course, that's half the class. The other half will go, how come those ladies figured it out and I didn't? What are they trying to do anyway? Anyway, ladies, um, all joking aside, thank you very much for doing that. I do appreciate it. Last semester, nobody answered the question. So it shows you what a heavyweight group this is. Okay, uh, always too far. Okay, so that's the highway and that's um, why it's there. The air road is the best part. I love the air road. The air road makes my day complete. Um, this is an aerial view of all the highway we've been talking about. It's Highway 80, Big Bend's here, Rainbow's Highway 40, parallels it, the river's down there and so on. And I'm gonna talk about this little place right there called Troy. And there's nothing there anymore, it used to be. There's nothing there anymore. But we're going to talk about Troy. If you do look at it, you can see a bend in the, in the tracks right there. Those are the tracks. And you see a bend. But we have to get, let's see if I can make a little bit closer. You look a little bit closer. Yeah, you still can't see much. At the tracks there, yeah, you can't see much. We better go back to the next one. Now, if you go to the next one, this is to close up. You see a couple of things again. You see, uh, an abandoned tunnel, which comes out over here. See that, see the tracks over there, but you also see this, which if you look closer, I love using this thing. There's an arrow right there. This is a concrete arrow. And this is basically built on top of the tunnel. There's a tunnel underneath it, which has been abandoned. And there's microwave towers up here and various things. Uh, I'm sure there's railroad stuff. You can see other buildings here, pads and stuff. So a little bit of stuff going on here, um, but not much. But this arrow is what I wanted to talk about here for a second. Let's see if I can get to the next one now. Without... No, I can't. Okay, go to the next one. Let's go to here. Um, this is this is Troy. This is right off the freeway, about a quarter mile um, near Cisco Grove, um, and this is an arrow. And what the arrow is for? The arrows are for airmail. In, in the 20s, they've just starting to get the airmail system going. And it was kind of a wild scene. The planes, the, the, um, planes flow really flew low. They weren't pressurized. And it was, really, it was pretty dangerous. They didn't have navigational systems. So the system they devised had a couple of pieces to it, one of which was concrete arrows. And every about every 10 miles, there would be a concrete arrow in the ground, and it would point to the next concrete arrow. The next concrete arrow is on, is on Signal Hill on Donner Ski Ranch, right on top of Donner Pass. So this points to that. It would also have on either side lights. And so lights, you'd almost make a tunnel for you. You have lights on the left, lights on the right, and then you would just fly that way. And you'd go from arrow to arrow to arrow. The lights obviously would help you at night, I would assume. Um, but so they, have, they would have these arrows, um, which is kind of weird. I thought that was a very odd thing. Well, there's more. Here's the arrow. This is the arrow at Troy, if you get up there. 
Um, I didn't get to get up there. I'll tell you why in a second, but you can see the microwave, the basis for the microwave towers and all the other equipment. That is the arrow right there. It's like it's kind of crumbling here a little bit, but this is pointing towards Donner Pass. And there's lots more of these around. This is what, this is this designation. San Francisco, Salt Lake, Troy, and Placer County. If you want to have something to do, you Google, let's see if I can get rid of this for it, Lori tells me to. I for me controls. If you want to do something when you're bored, you um, Google arrows across America and you get this website, which lists all of them, okay? And they notice, you notice the thing I wrote here, they seem to be in rural counties because obviously in the urban counties, they've been taken away. But there you get out there in the rural areas, they're all there. And we got, this is the one at Troy. This is the one on Nevada County, Donner Pass. This is Mogul on the way down to Reno. And you go in Tracy, Clark County, and it goes right across Nevada. A lot of them in Nevada because Nevada's rural. Tons of them in Nevada. And then they start getting into Utah, okay? Um, you want to look them up? Dreamsmithphotos.com backslash arrow backslash. You want to do those things. So they are around and you want to have a wild time. You can go out in the desert and find these forever. But they are on top of Donner Pass and Highway 40. So that was the way people would get across. And this, again, talks about the air highway. This is on Beacon Hill. This is on Signal Hill on Donner Ski Ranch. Um, Blue Canyon Airport is put there for a bunch of reasons. I always thought the reason Blue Canyon Airport was there was the, the um, Sacramento um, weather guys could go up to Blue Canyon and talk about the weather. But actually, there's a real reason because airports were located every 15 to 30 miles for emergency landings. Planes weren't that good then, nor were the cars, which is why all those little towns were there um, to give service. But they had to um, have airports located um, every 15 to 30 miles. I think the next one was out just out South Truckee where the next one was. Uh, this is a building on top of Donner Pass that was part of the aviation safety system also. So the air highway was there. Um, they still go over Donner Pass. If you've ever flown there, you go, but it's not the, obviously not the big deal. Now. They got, navigation really helped out a lot. Uh, must've been a wild time doing that kind of stuff. So which leads us to where did they go? There's no they, very few people on this one. This is more like a place thing. So there's some places you guys can go. Um, and we must be getting better because the snow's going away. So we can start doing these things. So uh, Highway 40, beginning at Big Bend, which is where the turnoff is. You can drive down Highway 40 and look at stuff and go slow and to your heart's delight. And if you look to your left, as you're going east, you start seeing ruins. I don't think the people who live there would like to consider them ruins because there's people building new houses there, but there's old stuff too. So you can see all this kind of stuff. This is sort of the guy that started, had a big deal as far as the area of Cisco Grove and stuff like that. You know, he was born in 1837, so if he were there, he was there when the railroad was there. Um, it could have been. So he was a kind of a big pioneer. His, his um, little monument is there. And you get towards Hampshire Rocks. This is um, X Fountain. This is the elect. This used to be the electrical building um, for this particular area. It's now just kind of sits there. Sorry. Whoa! Why did I do that? And again, Ben fireplace, that kind of stuff. She's look around, it's all there. And the um, hotels that are there aren't doing the business they used to do. COVID must have killed them, um, but they're just not what they used to be. And the house, you know, it's just not as many people. It's very quiet. It's always very quiet, even in the summer. Hampshire Rocks, by the way, I mentioned this before, greatest campsite in the world, if you don't mind freeway noise. Just beautiful place to go. If you got um, noise canceling earphones, that's your place. Victory Highway, as um, Ron, as we have two people identify it. This is downtown Truckee. Just walk down the street, you'll find it. And this is on um, Freeport Boulevard in Sacramento. I think it's a kind of cross street from a mortuary, I believe. Um, so that is there. Then we got Dog Valley Road. It begins in Verde, Nevada on Highway 80. And I, this is in Boldface. Um, I'm sure you, nobody likes to sit there once a week and get have Bill Sullivan tell them what to do. I'm gonna tell you what to do. Get a good map and you need a high clearance car or truck, but it's a great drive, man, it's a historic drive. Um, don't do something stupid, very, very rural back there. And it's, it's not like it used to be because I'm sure it's been logged over, but it's pretty close, probably pretty close. Um, again, the Summit Valley, you just pull off 
Um, it's easy to find. Google Van Norden Lake Historic Trail for a map. You get to this downtown um, Soda Springs. It's where the where the roads cross, and you'll see where this um, lake used to be. And you just drive down. You can drive, take a left hand turn, and just go see all this stuff. Easy to see. Great. Um, if you're into the Immigrant Trail, great examples of that. This is the, some of the best ones I've ever seen. Goes right through here. There's always the trains, and I I poo poo trains, and I will poo poo trains next week too. Trains are okay. They're kind of fun when they go by. It's just nice and big, and the earth shakes and stuff. And notice all the engines. It's hard to get across on our pass. It's hit. It's hard. It's usually four. Yeah, one, two, three, four. There'd be four. I think there's four engines there. They usually are four. Um, so they don't they don't have as much business as they used to. I think one of the reasons is they're doing double deckers, which kind of takes the place of an extra train. But they're not doing the work. They, they're not doing the traffic they used to. But you can certainly go there. And the arrows in the gates of Troy. Fascinating story. At least I thought it was fascinating at the time. Um, first part of October this year, I wanted to see what I could see before it snowed. And I wanted to see Troy. I wanted to go see the um, concrete arrows. So after getting lost, like which is what I always do, um, I ended up on this road. And it was, it was the road to Troy. And I ended up, and there was a split in the road. And there was a gate over here and a gate over here. And I stopped and there was a late, I stopped over here and there was a lady over here and she had stopped at the gate. And she looked at me like, what kind of a freak are you buddy? And I made my best, I practiced hard not to be, look weird. And then we started, I sat, sat there and ate my lunch and we started talking and she was gonna meet the lady, the property owner of this property up here, who was also the property owner of this property. And she was waiting for her and she wasn't coming. So we had a nice conversation, I explained where I was from the Renaissance Society, I gave her the whole spiel and um, had a nice conversation. And then the lady came down finally, she's half hour late. I think when you live up there, you're kind of laid back. So she showed up a half hour late. She said the reason she was up there was she's, um because it was COVID and it was all the shutdown. She was um helping her grandchildren with school, which I suspect is not an unusual thing in this audience, but that's what she was doing too. She came down and she said, um, I, she asked me what I was doing. Very, very curious, very suspicious. I explained it all and she said she went to Sacramento State and I, I looked okay. And I said, can I go back there? And she said, anytime you want, you can go back there. And I said, what's with the gates? And I, it was a good, perfectly logical answer. High school and college kids will go back there and have a wild time. You drive back there in that road, you take you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll back there and have a wild time. So that's what would happen. And she said when she was a kid, she would play by the tracks and play in those tunnels. Um, so it's there, you park here, you want to walk it's about a quarter mile. She said it was okay for me, so I assume it's okay with you. Okay, it is does say some exertion required. This is uphill. By the way, you take the right hand one. It is uphill and you're in elevation. So understand it's gonna be a little more difficult than walking on the flats. So be aware of that. And that's a Troy. I mentioned about trails a little bit ago, and I talked about um, if you, you can tell you're on an immigrant trail very commonly because the rocks are thrown to the side. This happened last year. And I'll read this to you, it's fascinating stuff. Basically, I won't read it to you. Basically, it was a fire up in, um, it had to be up in here, had to be up in there. And the fire, look what it cleared out. It cleared out the trail. All of a sudden, you can see all the rocks thrown to the side and there's the trail. And I don't know what they did after that. I know what, one thing they did was they didn't tell you where it was. They did not tell. There's potential artifacts. I wonder if they went over it in metal detectors, if they even can to see if anything were there. But um, it's got to be up here where they had those fires last summer. And got to talk about straight as an arrow trail. There it was. Um, which brings you back to the, art, the um, antiquities um, law. Anything you find, you leave it there. And if you dig it up, you bury it again. Um, so history is where you find it. And it is. Recommended. Um, Trey and Monica Pitzenberger. They have um, this blog that they will mail you forever. Uh, and it's about two minutes, maybe up to five. A lot about, a lot of, a lot about roads. Here's an example of it. Um, they, he does a lot of investigation of Lincoln Highway and so on. He's pretty good, actually. I kind of enjoy it. So let's do two minutes of Trey and Monica here. All right, now you're looking down the old Donner Trail. That's the uh, parking lot down there for the uh, Pacific Crest uh, Trail. And just about another 100 yards from there is Lake Mary. So you would have come up uh, the trail this direction. Of course, that's also the Lincoln Highway. 
and that is where the trail goes and the Lincoln Highway went. This part of the road takes you back up uh, to Highway 40, but is not part of the original route. This is the old Donner Trail and Lincoln Highway over the summit. We are right now at, I would say, the summit, Donner Summit, because from here on, it starts to go down toward Donner Lake. You can see the sign there for the summit trails. And if you want to hike uh, the Mount Judah Trail or hit the Pacific Crest Trail, you go down that way right there. But here is the old Donner Pass Trail and the Lincoln Highway. And here is that concrete pole I had seen a couple of years or a year or so ago, and I meant to come back and Gosh, I thought it looked more like a Lincoln Highway type uh, concrete pole, but uh, it, it doesn't. But nevertheless, this is the trail. We're going to head down there following the old Lincoln Highway and even earlier Donner Immigrant Trail. Shoot. And if Trey knew what he was talking about, um, the 1844 on that concrete post was 1844 with Stevens Towns and Murphy Party. And um, the road he was on, if he kept walking, was the Lincoln Highway. And if he kept walking, he would have got to the Stevens Towns and Murphy Monument. And if he went further, he would have walked right underneath that underpass we had and right underneath the railroad. So as I told you, up there is where the action is. There's a lot of stuff up there, a lot of stuff. So good place to go. And he's got lots of... Um, Lots of videos. Just look up Trey Pitsenberger, and you get on his list, and you get them out every couple of days or so. Okay, Resor resources that I use, um, they're, they're really good. Sierra Crossing, first roads to California. Got all there were were roads. It's amazing the roads aren't even there anymore, uh, and what the roads became. So that's an excellent book. It's readable too, um, with the classic picture of Donner Lake, Lincoln Highway. Greetings from the Lincoln Highway. That's the classic greetings from the postcard they used to send. This will take you all the way across the country. Um, and take it monument to monument, place to place. Um, excellent book to read, um, really enjoyable. Take it with you when you go someplace. Now, next week, make sure I didn't miss one, I did not. Okay, first of all, for those of you people that are, um, I'll get to this in a second. Next week, we're gonna talk about recreation, the park, Hollywood, and the area's future. They kind of tie up some loose ends. This is a picture, one of the first pictures we looked at, this is Albert Bierstadt. The question mark there is not some cosmic question like what's in the afterlife. I was kind of worried when I put the question mark there. The question mark and Albert Bierstadt's pictures kind of lend it to that because they're so ethereal and heavenly looking. You know, like there's, there's got to be a spirit out there someplace. Uh, in this particular case, this question mark is what's going to happen up there? And that's what gets covered next week and gets covered with the, the, um, the future. And again, loose ends. and It's kind of like a lot of recreation and what goes on up there now. So that all being said, I think I, Lori told me once before the start, I was supposed to ask for questions. 